All right, before we get into the sermon, I just wanted to give you a quick announcement for those of you who missed my letter this week or missed the announcements in my letter, maybe didn't read it all the way through to the end. Um, The consistory and I have been talking about uh, reopening the church. When are we going to do that? What is that going to look like? And as of today, uh, we've decided that probably the best thing for our church is for us to wait until our county has moved into phase four of Governor Inslee's uh, reopening plans. Phase four says that uh, groups of 50 or more can meet together. And so our church, uh, before COVID-19, was hovering around 70 people. Uh, Right before we closed down, we were right around 49, 50 people. So we really think the best thing for us is to wait until that phase four. Now, if you do the math and look at kind of the three weeks between each phases, and I know that's an optimistic projection, uh, but if you do that kind of math right now, that would put us at the earliest right around mid-July. And I know for some of you that's a really long time and, and you're really struggling through this, but hopefully that gives you at least an idea of what we're shooting for. Now, even when we do reopen, we will have all kinds of safety measures, uh, probably encouraging people to wear masks, encouraging people to spread out, still uh, allowing or encouraging people to stay home if they're vulnerable or feeling scared about uh, being together. And we will still try and provide our services and, and for sure our sermons online for people for a good while longer. So just want to let you know that's where we're heading. Of course, this is Uh, given the assumption that everything is going well in our state. And it could be longer if uh, if we have to go backwards with those phases or have to shut down again. But middle of July right now is our best guess of when we might reopen. And I just wanted to let you guys know about that. Hey guys, welcome to Faith Community Church. Last week we had a lot of positive feedback about John and Tanya's video. People asking us, how come we can't do videos every single week? Well, the truth is, it's a ton of extra work, mostly for John and Paul to balance the sound and the lighting and all those good things. Plus, we don't always have the capacity to do that on our website. So instead of trying to shoot those high-quality videos for you every week, we decided we'd do these little intro videos to let you know that we care about you, we love you, we're here for you. So I'm walking into church right now, ready to get my sermon on, and I hope you're ready to join me. I love you guys, and I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Having said that, uh, the past few weeks I've been talking about a series called Mothers of the Faith. And uh, in this series, I first started talking about uh, Deborah and uh, Jael and the story uh, highlighting the strength of women, particularly women who put their faith in God. Last week, we then talked about Ruth and Naomi, and we studied this word called hesed, How hesed is this loving kindness, a faithfulness that goes above and beyond one's regular duty or requirements. We talked about God's hesed towards us and how we are supposed to put that into practice in loving those inside and outside the church. Today I'm going to get into the story of Hannah. And Hannah's story is both very simple and complicated. In fact, it's complicated because of its simplicity. The story itself is fairly straightforward, uh, but it leaves us asking, what are we supposed to learn from this? What is God saying to us? And I've been reading over it several times this week, praying about it, studying for it, and I think I've come to about three or four important lessons or conclusions that we can learn from this. So I'm excited to share these with you today. Hannah comes to us in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2. And this is during the end of the time of the judges and the beginning of the time of the kings. And some people even say that Samuel himself was probably the last judge. But this story happens all around this woman by the name of Hannah. And Hannah is married to a man by the name of Elkanah. The problem is, Hannah is not Elkanah's only wife. In those days, monogamy in Israel was the norm and was expected to only have one wife, but occasionally there was polygamy, and this was especially true when there was a reason for it, a reason for marrying or taking on a second wife, and one of those reasons that we see every now and then uh, through people of Israel is when a woman was barren, 
when she wasn't able to have kids, then the husband would sometimes take on a second wife just so that he could have children so that someone would be able to carry on his name and the family line. And this was the case with Elkanah and Hannah. Hannah was barren. She wasn't able to have kids, and they tried probably for many, many years. And finally, after her not having any kids, Elkanah married a second wife by the name of Panina. Now, this was extremely hard for Hannah. Hannah was extremely saddened by this and destitute over this. It was uh, very shameful in those days for a woman not to have kids. Uh, They were kind of defined in their identity by their children and by having a family. And the fact that Hannah hadn't been able to have kids was embarrassing for her. And probably people in the community were gossiping about this. There was a belief in those days that if you were barren, that's probably because God was cursing you and you had done something wrong. And Hannah, without any kids, was extremely sad by this. But to make matters worse, Panina would come and make fun of her for it, would tease her for it, would uh, persecute her for it. And so this left Hannah more and more saddened the older she got. Well, every year Elkanah would take his family and they would go up to the town of Shiloh. And at Shiloh is where they had the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and people would offer sacrifices to celebrate the Passover. And one year as they went up to this festival and to offer their sacrifices, Panina was being extra mean, extra hard on Hannah, making fun of her and teasing her. And so Hannah was so distraught and and sad by this that she couldn't even eat. During the time of the festival, after the sacrifices were over, she was weeping and crying and just had no appetite. And it says that Elkanah turns to her and asks her what is wrong. And he's extremely loving here and and telling her, look, I love you no matter what, even if you don't have any children. That's okay with me. I love you. I care for you. And typical of a man to do, he offers her two shares of meat, thinking that maybe this will help her feel better. Uh, But it doesn't. And Hannah is so sad that eventually she just gets up and she leaves the table. And she goes off to another part of the tabernacle, probably the outer court where the women were allowed to go and pray. And she just begins crying out to God and pouring out her heart to God. But it says that her lips are moving, but no sound is coming out. She's simply praying in her heart. And while she's doing this, Eli the priest sees this. Now, Eli isn't that bright and isn't that wise, but he comes up to her and he sees her lips moving, but nothing coming out. And so he assumes that she's drunk. And she says, he says to her, Hannah, why are you crying? Why, why are you uh, drunk? And, and you should give up your drink and, and stop making a fool of yourself here. But Hannah looks up at him and he says, she says, I've been crying out to God and asking God to give me a child because I'm barren. And she shares with him how she's made a deal with God, that if God would only give her a son, she promises she would return that son to him and turn him over to the tabernacle, to the priests, to be raised as one of them in service of the Lord in the tabernacle. And she promises that he would even be a Nazarite, that she would never cut his hair, never give him anything fermented to drink, wine or alcohol of any kind, that he would be 100% dedicated to God. When Eli hears this and sees how earnest she is, he blesses her and prays for her and declares to her that God has heard her prayer and will answer her prayer. And sure enough, Hannah then goes back with Elkanah and the rest of the family to their town. She soon after gets pregnant and gives birth to her son and she names him Samuel. And the name Samuel means heard by God. Or, God hears me. We then go into the second part of our story. In the second part of the story, a year later, as Hannah is raising her son, Samuel, still a little baby, Elkanah comes to her and says, all right, we're going up to Shiloh again, going up to the sacrifices and the celebrations. Are you coming with me, and are you going to uh, stay good on your promise? Are you going to surrender Samuel to the Lord? And Hannah says, no, he's still too young to do this. 
And instead, I'm going to stay home and continue uh, taking care of him and feeding him. And when he's old enough, then I will surrender him to God and, and honor my promise. And Elkanah looks at her and he says, all right, but you better make sure you do that. Because God will hold you accountable to make sure you keep your promises. And sure enough, a few years go by, and after she has weaned uh, Samuel, she takes him to the tabernacle, and she introduces him to Eli and says, do you remember me? I was the one who called out to God and asked this of him, and he heard me and he answered my prayers, so now I am fulfilling my vow by giving him back to God, and I entrust him to you so that he can serve God wholeheartedly and 100% be dedicated to God, just like I t said I would. Eli blesses her, and Hannah then goes home, and the story tells us there are two more things that happened. First of all, we see that there is a song or a poem that Hannah writes, and scholars believe that it was actually a contemporary psalm or hymn being used, but then it was placed here as part of this story to teach us the lesson of the story. And this psalm talks about how God shames the proud but lifts up the humble. How he breaks the bows of the warriors but arms the weak with strength. How those who are full end up poor but those who are empty hunger no more. How the woman who was barren now has seven children but the woman who had many sons pines away. The psalm or the hymn then ends by exalting God in all the earth, stating that God gives strength to the king and exalts the horn of his anointed one. Now this is a strange way to end the psalm or the hymn because at this time when Hannah and Samuel are first starting in this story, there is no king. They don't have any king. And only later does God provide a king after the people beg and ask for Samuel to give them one. And then, of course, it is Samuel who anoints David as king. So we believe that probably this psalm or this hymn and this whole story was written down during the time that King David was king as a way of showing that God favors King David through the anointing of Samuel. The story then ends with one more thing. It tells us that every year, Hannah would go up to visit Samuel as part of offering the sacrifices, and she would make for him new clothes. And when she would see him, we see him dressed in this priestly ephod, and this was the garment of a priest. And so for Samuel to be dressed in this way as a young boy is this amazing thing. And I imagine Hannah beaming with pride, seeing her son dressed as a priest, and then it tells us that Eli would pray blessings over her, asking God to reward her because she stayed faithful to her vows. And sure enough, God blesses her with five more kids, three more sons and two daughters. But then it says in chapter 2, verse 21, that Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. And that's the end of our story. So like I said, this uh, story is fairly straightforward, but it leaves us asking, what are we supposed to learn from this? What are we supposed to get out of this? And I believe there are at least uh, four points that we can learn from this. And remember, the Bible tells us that every story, every scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God to teach us and to help us grow closer to him. So what is God saying to us today? What are we supposed to learn today? Well, first of all, I believe that uh, the first, uh, to the first audience that this was written to, this story helps to confirm both Samuel and David. Now, I'm guessing most of you don't spend a lot of time thinking about this or worrying about this and going, you know, oh, why did they choose David as king? And he really shouldn't have been king. It should have been Jonathan, Saul's son. He should have been the next king. Probably we don't ever stop to think about that. We're not losing any sleep about that. But for the first audiences, they probably did wonder. They had seen Saul chosen in that very public gathering where Samuel had given Saul that blessing to be king. And then we see how David took over after Saul died. But David wasn't in Saul's line. And so people probably did wonder, why is David being king instead of Jonathan? 
And so this story, by going back to the origins of Samuel and how he was born this miraculous birth to a barren woman and how he was then completely dedicated to God, hearing God's voice at an early age, being filled with the Holy Spirit, becoming this great prophet of God, it shows us that indeed God is with Samuel. And so what Samuel says is of God. And so if Samuel says that David is king, then that's God's choice, not just man's choice. And of course, David became Israel's greatest king, not only in power, militarily and politically, but also the greatest king who was sold out on worshiping God and giving his heart to God. And so this confirms that this is all God's will and part of God's plan. Like I said, probably most of you don't really care too much about that. You already believe the Bible and have understood that David was really from God. But this is important to us for another reason. And that is that Jesus is said to be descended from King David. Jesus takes his throne from King David's line. And when you look at the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew and Luke in particular, you see these genealogies that trace Mary and Joseph's lineage back to King David. So really what this is showing us is that Jesus also is in this line and that Jesus also is very much a part of God's will and God's plan. And it shows us that God all throughout history is in control. During the time of the judges, when there was uh, famines and difficulties and persecution from other nations and even great sin from the people of Israel, God was in control. During the time in the life of Hannah, where she's mourning and suffering and in agony because she's not able to have any kids, God is in control. During the time of Jesus when he is born, God is still in control, even in the midst of the Roman persecution and the difficulties and the sins of Israel. God is in control. All throughout history, God is in control. And I want to show you something absolutely amazing that I discovered this week while I was studying this story. If you think about the way that David was anointed as king, it started with this birth of Samuel being born to this barren woman whose husband goes up to the temple to offer the sacrifices. She then receives this confirmation from God that she will have a child. And indeed she does, but she completely dedicates him to God as a Nazarite. He ends up growing up filled with the Holy Spirit as a prophet. And then later on, he anoints David to become king. Well, think about the way that Jesus was launched into ministry. For Jesus, it started with the birth of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, remember, we studied that story back at Christmas time. He was also born to a barren woman, old in age, without child. She goes up, or her husband goes up to the temple to offer the rituals and the, the rites that he's supposed to do, and then receives this confirmation from God that she will bear a child. Sure enough, she bears a child and dedicates him completely to God as a Nazarite. He is filled with the Holy Spirit from birth and becomes this great prophet. And then in baptizing Jesus, launches him into ministry. So we see these two parallels, almost the exact same story happening to confirm that God is indeed behind these things. That God is indeed in control. And so for us who are going through this COVID-19 and the stay at home and the quarantines and all that goes with it, it can feel like life is out of control, like there's so much uncertainty and we, and we wish we knew what was going to happen and we wish we could make plans and it caught us all by surprise, but it did not catch God by surprise. God knew it was going to happen. And if he's allowed this to happen, then it must be for good reasons. It must be because he's going to work good out of this. That he's going to use it to draw people close to him. That he's going to use it to continue to extend and to build his kingdom and to be glorified in the midst of this. And so we can trust that he is still in control. This week I was watching one of those goofy uh, COVID-19 videos, those just kind of funny videos and it was this woman who had gone uh, back in the past to visit her past self. 
And so future self is talking to past self before the virus has erupted. And she tells her past self, she says, you know what? Uh, Now might be a good time for you to go to the store and stock up on toilet paper. And the past self says, no, 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 I've got enough toilet paper, I'm fine. And future self says, no, you really want to go to the store and get some toilet paper. And she then tells her, well, while you're at it, pick up some stuff for you to be able to pursue any hobbies that you might have wanted to start. And past self says, hobbies? Who has time for hobbies? I'm so busy with work and going out and hanging out with friends and all this stuff. And future self says, yeah, you really want to get those supplies. You're going to want to pursue some hobbies. And then she says, you know what? You might even want to adopt a dog. You've always wanted a dog. Now's a great time to have a pet. And the past self says, I don't have time for that. I've got all these travels planned. I've got these business trips I'm going to be taking, these vacations. I've got that cruise I'm signed up for. And future self just starts to laugh and goes, oh my goodness, you have no idea. All right, all of this has caught us all off guard. It surprised us, but it has not surprised God. God remains in control, and we can trust in that. And because God is good, we can trust that his plans will result in our good as well. This leads me then to our third point. Our third point says that God hears you or he remembers you. In our story, we see Hannah at the beginning just crying out to God, extremely distraught and emotional, so sad and torn up about this. But finally, we see that God hears her and answers her prayers. And when he does that, in chapter 1, verse 19, it says, the Lord remembered her. Now, this doesn't mean that he had forgotten about her before. Instead, it means that she had felt like He had forgotten about her. And when we go through difficult times, when we go through trials and suffering and struggles, it often feels like God has very much forgotten about us, like he doesn't hear us or knows what's going on. But this story teaches us that God always remembers us. He always hears us. He hears you when you cry out to him and are praying to him. He sees you when you're struggling and having a hard time, and he cares. This doesn't mean that God will always give us exactly what we want, but we can trust and know that God will always give us exactly what we need. Before leaving and going up into heaven, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. God hears you, and he is here with you in the midst of the trials and the storms of this life. So trust in that and depend in that. And finally, we have uh, one last lesson that this story teaches us. It's a story that teaches us to keep our promises and really more than just keeping our promises, to surrender our lives to God. Hannah, in this story, we see her making this deal with God. And I don't think the point of the story is to teach us that that's a good thing to do. Actually, I think that's probably not the wisest thing to do at all. Uh, A lot of times in our lives, we feel like we need to negotiate with God, to make these deals with God, and I think it's human nature to do that, and I know I've done that my fair share of times, and we see people all throughout the Bible doing that, and and throughout history, I think Martin Luther even uh, became a Christian that way through this giant storm. He, He said, God, if you'll save me, then I'll become a monk and dedicate myself to you, and sure enough, he does. Uh, But the point isn't that we should be making those deals. Instead, the point is simply that if you have made promises to God, that you should keep them. And maybe there are some of you out there who have made promises to God throughout this uh, virus, or maybe before that you have made promises to God. And this story is a reminder to us to keep those promises. When Hannah uh, gives birth to Samuel and she's holding on to him, Elkanah comes to her and says, you better make sure you keep your word and keep your promise to God because he will hold you accountable to that. But then ultimately, this story is for us to learn to surrender our lives to God. I think Hannah is considered a hero and a mother of the faith because she does the hardest thing for any mother to do, and that is to release and let go of her son and to entrust him to God. And she keeps her word and honors God by giving Samuel, her son, over to God, only visiting him about once a year. 
When our son Nathaniel was born, he was born in Panama while we were living over there. Uh, He was born at first with a mild case of jaundice. And what happened was that the nurses and the doctor said, we can't let you hold on to him. We can't let you take him home yet. Instead, we have to keep him in this incubator with these special lights and a blindfold. And for new parents, brand new parents living in a foreign country, this was extremely hard for us and extremely difficult for me. And I found myself just crying out to God and praying and begging God to heal our son and to allow him to come home with us. And I remember very clearly as I was doing that, God speaking to me and saying, Andrew, you need to let go. Are you willing to turn your son over to me? Are you willing to trust me with the life of your son? And in that moment, in my heart and in my mind, I had to make this decision. And it was like this little switch that I had to flip where I said, all right, God, I release him unto you. I surrender the life of my son to you, trusting that you have his best interests at heart, that you are powerful and able and will do whatever is best. And this switch happened in me that I knew I had let go and released him into God and was trusting God. And in that moment, I realized that is the best place for my son to be. And it doesn't mean that I stopped uh, being a good steward of my son and taking care of him or, or being a good dad. It just meant that I knew that God was the one who held his life and I had let go of that control. One of the things I've been reading uh, recently is this article saying that one of the most difficult things about this virus is that we feel like we've lost control. But really, we're not losing control. We're losing the illusion of control. Because ultimately, as we already said, God is in control. And I believe what God asks us to do is he asks us to let go and to surrender every part of our life to him. Our health, our wealth, our jobs, our possessions, our relationships, our time, everything that we are and do, God calls us to let go and say, okay, God, I understand and I believe that they are yours. They're not mine. And that I am simply a steward assigned to take care of them for a short time. And it's about trusting God with our life and saying, God, I will do whatever you ask, whatever you want, And you have the right to give and to take away. And these things that we become anxious about or sad about, really what they show is that we have not yet let them go to God. And so this is an opportunity for us to surrender these things to God and to say to God, God, I choose to trust you. I choose to let go and to surrender these things to you. And ultimately, that's what being a Christian is all about. Our story ends by saying that Samuel was ministering before the Lord. And it shows us this picture of Hannah just exulting with pride over her son. So proud that here's this young boy already as a priest and a prophet hearing God's voice. And it's this recognition that when you let go and allow God to lead your life and to be in control, that is the best place for you to be. So may we, like the nation of Israel, learn to recognize that God is sovereign, God is in control. And may we, like Hannah, learn to surrender our lives to him, to serve him, to fulfill our commitment to love and obey him, and to give our lives to him. At this time, would you please join me in prayer? God, I thank you so much for this story that teaches us this important lesson uh, at a time where we probably need it. To remember, Lord, that you are in control. You always have been. And you are moving your plans forward. And we've seen that over the last several weeks, ever since Easter, Lord. This lesson over and over again. Help us to truly believe that in the depths of our hearts. And help us, Lord, to learn to let go of these things that we cling to so tightly. Help us to learn to surrender every part of our life to you. Please show us, Lord, these areas of our life where we're still holding on where we still become very much afraid or sad or anxious about things. 
Help us to let go and be filled instead with your peace, to fully submit ourselves to your will. We praise your name, Jesus, and we thank you for your goodness and your love in our lives. At this time, please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.